Okay, everybody, we're going to start up again. So appreciate if you could take your seats. So we have two more presentations this afternoon before we go into a um, discussion session. And so the first presentation is going to be on uh, multi-species models uh, by, by Jim. Where is Jim? Where is Jim? Okay, since Jim's not there, I'll give his presentation. <laughs> Actually, I've, I've got his notes here. I can just read it. <laughs> so anyway, um, while we're waiting, so there's a um, another pub organized tonight. So make sure you come with us so we can start some more informal discussions about the next general model. Now Jim's getting a coffee, his, his time is slowly running out. <laughs> You're up, you've been introduced. I read the first page for you. Oh, thanks. I don't have to talk about this. Well, thanks everybody and it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to uh, New Zealand for, for organizing this. It's been very enjoyable. Uh, just a couple of co-authors. I'm gonna go through uh, several things. And first thing, I, I, I really like this uh, picture. It, it's from a long time ago. Um, and I, I like it because it kind of introduces um, what my kids used to ask me what I do. And, and I used to, what do I click? The down button. I, I used to say I get to think about fish, and I still do. I like to think about fish. It's a cool picture to think about uh, fish and lots of uh, interesting things. This is very awkward setting here, the whole thing. The microphone's far from the computer, complaining. I didn't get a snack. Your time is off, Nick. <laughs> no, but now I'm in the freaking light. <laughs> It's all right. Simon, thank you for everything. All right. Um, so yeah, we got to look at this picture, but here's the, the topics I'd like to cover today, kind of uh, going on to um, the, the things that are interesting to me. Uh, I do single species stock assessment mostly. Uh, I've been invited to talk about some multi-species work. Uh, my colleagues taking the mantle on that, Kirsten Holzman. She's been doing some really interesting stuff. I will go through that for the second half, but I do have a couple of uh, single species things. Oh, this was just sent to me. Uh, the uh, food stand at, at uh, University Village is now selling Pollock noodles as a health option. Highly recommended. Are those the IUU ones? The IUU ones from Japan, no. Anyway, I wanna to touch on random effects modeling. Uh, some, some new things that we're doing, uh, some shortcuts, and uh, maybe some criticisms. People can straighten me out on, on whether it's a valid criticism or not. But first, I wanted to talk about my life a little bit. Um, 1979, computers. Uh, I got my first fishery job because Pierre Kleiber uh, had to, in an emergency, convert a card deck of a tagging database from SPC he just got his PhD from UBC and um, needed to record it to a uh, magnetic tape. And he was scheduled to go out on the tagging boat. And I just happened to be in New Caledonia visiting a friend there. And uh, I was a warm body, very young in that picture. Oh, uh, <laughs> and and um, got, got a job, went to Gilbert Islands before they were independent as Kiribati and uh, made enough money to go skiing in New Zealand for a whole season. So, so at that time, so there's the punch card example. Uh, between the next decade, um, I actually went back and got a real education 
but I took a computer class. It was horrible. Uh, I learned APL, a programming language, uh, really elegant, good linear algebra tool. It wrote population dynamic models in it. It was fantastic. And then put it down and then couldn't read it next time I picked it up. But there were a few people that were doing that back then. Then I ended up at uh, SPC again, and uh, we had a brand new computer. John Hampton will remember this. It was very expensive, so we couldn't afford any software, but we had Unix on it, which we all had to learn, and it was awesome. Um, just on the software side, people that uh, have tools, they should, you know, I was surprised yesterday, nobody stood up and said something strongly about Emacs as an editor. I tended to, I'm a VI person. That was the uh, Unix, uh, experience back then. I still use VI on a routine basis, but it's a very powerful tool. In fact, did you know that Gmail, if you do Gmail online, there's, you could set it so it does all the same keystrokes as VI, so you don't have to use a mouse. You can just scroll between your emails. But obviously the best developers at Google use VI, so <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so that was uh, kind of the VI period. Um, then I got a job at NOAA after finishing a PhD at UW. I was on my job description there. The advert was must have experience in stock synthesis. And this was 1992 or so in Fortran. And I was like three people, three people. And they were all within 10 feet of each other at, at work that had those skills. And so I got a job and I've been in that job since then. Um, pretty boring. But I do have to say something. I, I do want to say, um, you know, through this period, I, I did have Dave Fournier as a mentor. And um, he's at times said that the reason ADMB exists was because people that were not smart enough to program uh, needed something that could use as a tool. And so, you know, Vivian Haste and I were his model uh, subjects for testing, uh, testing applications. So that was a interesting time and I you know a lot of the things that we're talking about today are, I think stem from work of from Fournier. Um, in fact in 1998 World Cup in, the, in Europe we gave a course Dave and I on 80 model builder in at the Danish Technical Institute and a couple of students are still in the audience Hans and Anders were there. Um, I impressed them with my Excel skills, I think. Uh, 2009 was a de decline in Pollock. Um, very, been doing the assessment and that was, uh, what was I gonna say that, about that? Anyway, four decades, pretty fun, really grateful. Uh, just a, uh, one comment on coding. You know, Matthew was talking yesterday about making things encapsulated and, you know, so, 80 model builder, this, this was it. And I just wonder, my comment earlier this morning, having to do with tools and the ability, you know, intimidation factor of getting into, you know, from going from a Excel, you know, kind of GUI type world that we're in to programming, um, is it intimidating to dive into TMD uh, for, for biologist types? Uh, because that's, a lot of us have that background, yet still need the tools and, and applications. So that's kind of one theme just wanted to uh, say. And, you know, a lot of stock assessment models are not that hard. Uh, Nick did a fantastic job talking about some of the hard problems. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, in a lot of fisheries in the world, um, those, those problems don't have to be as complicated. But even behind those, you can still have structure and, and readability as, as a main feature uh, for, this is the BI screen capture, by the way. Nobody's gonna be impressed with my BI. Is there anybody that uses VI? Yes. <laughs> well, if you're in GitHub and you get a commit and you're stuck, it's VI command that they want you to use. <laughs> so you have to call one of us up to figure out how to quit out. Anyway. Um, Moving on to actual stuff, um, what I want to talk a little bit about is a single species model and uh, apologies to some of the people that were in Seattle last week, but I gave a talk on this Pollock stock assessment that I turned in yesterday and getting comments back today. Um, but basically we have uh, uh, 
standard survey area that here the red uh, tri uh, stars mean places where they did bottom trawls with no catch. Um, this was back in 2010 and you have this highlighted area um, in the north, which is outside our normal survey area. We, we went there in 2010, not expecting to see any pollock and we didn't see any pollock. And then we went back there in, um, in 2017, actually 17, and found a lot of pollock, significant numbers, over a million tons in that, that one little region based on the area swept approach. And then uh, we went, because of that, went back up there with what little boat time we had, still saw fish up there and then went back there again this year. And yes, there's still Pollock up there, but, um, but those are the, so, so, you know, this presents a problem. We got fish that are moving their distribution. How do we deal with them and what are the approaches? And so uh, Jim Thorson took a job with our center. And because of that, we have some ready accessibility to tools that um, most of you are probably hearing a lot about. But basically, it's a, the vector autoregressive spatial temporal modeling approach that he's developed. And what I'm showing here are some density maps uh, from that same region, uh, looking at what, what it maps out to. And what you can see is that the whole area is covered for the whole period. And so the way the model's configured, and what's nice about it, is that you can actually um, go down and compute indices uh, for periods where you, you weren't even surveying. And so what that does is it takes into account the fact that you see a lot of fish here, the spatial correlation will tell you roughly, the estimate of the spatial correlation will tell you what the expectation is a certain distance away. And so it's able to say, well, if you see a lot of pollock right on the edge of the standard survey area, that Northern area that we didn't visit that year, I think it's 2003 here. We didn't go into the Northern area in 2003 uh, the middle one is, sorry, the Northern Bering Sea area that's not surveyed every year. It's only been 2010 and those figures I showed you. Um, but there was estimates of, of uh, biomass there and the estimates of uncertainty. See how big they are compared to the years when we were actually in that survey area. So it's a nice way to uh, bring into new methods and ways of dealing with stuff we all know about, that spatial correlation is a real thing and, and that um, there's autocorrelation that also can happen. And so this year, we also uh, went further and used it for the age compositions themselves, uh, correlating those in space. And this is just a map of the densities of, of four-year-old Pollock. So this is uh, decidedly probably not a data for a stock. And then a uh, similar one for um, eight-year-olds. And so we incorporated those in the assessment this year as an option. And this just shows the, uh, the, the difference in the age compositions between the two types of estimation approaches. So um, anybody that's used time series in a stock assessment model, um, as any, what, what's one thing about this index that might be unusual to just throw into stock synthesis or another uh, package? Well. One thing is that by definition, there's autocorrelation between the years. So all of a sudden now you can't treat them as, oh, I, this is an independent observation from last year because there's information that spans both things. And so this is a plug for being able to have your own tool that you can just go and literally in three lines of code without a design document, I was able to put in autocorrelation, the full covariance matrix over time which is output from the vast model. Uh, so it's really straightforward. Um, it, it does include an if statement probably that, um, but I didn't notice the performance knock. Um, I have, you can switch between using a covariance matrix and not. So it's, it's a, a bit of both. So that's, a, that's uh, one of the aspects of single species models. I, I wanted to uh, touch on a couple of others. Oh, the colors went away. Oh no. Anyway, it's not, it's not the end of the world. Um, but uh, these are that same assessment and just some example data that are fit in this model. And I just wanted to focus on uh, one of the things, this is a bottom trial scientifically conducted, uh, very rigorously uh, monitored 
make sure the nets on the bottom when they count how many uh, meters, square meters it's covering and, and the like. But uh, we have what we call time varying availability. So pollock are semi-demersal, meaning sometimes they're right on the bottom, sometimes they're in the midwater, and that pattern can vary by, by age uh, over time. And so I've always acknowledged that, but I've never been able to defend, well, how much variability do you allow? And so what I wanted to say is some, um, bring in, in some new information to try to get at that, that value. How much variability could you allow? Um, so basically the, the support for having spatial, uh, or sorry, uh, process errors in, in, in a scientifically survey is, is to um, acknowledge that, you know, the fish do move, they don't stay in the same place in the water column. Uh, it's likely not to be the same every year. Um, and this is just the vertical distribution. We also saw there was obviously outside movement uh, patterns too. So three-dimensional availability issues. Well, one of the approaches um, was to look at the layers. In this layer uh, approach, we have a data-rich situation. We've got um, an area on the, the blue part here on the right is what the bottom trial doesn't catch or see. And the, the blue area on the left is what the acoustics see, doesn't see. And so what we've done, or what uh, postdoc who's now going to start working with us as uh, Cole Monahan's done this work uh, is come up with a way to evaluate both of these simultaneously using spatial temporal models. So it's this overlapping thing and I think I, I coined the name that it's it's a combined overlapping layers of echo signs so it comes out to Cole uh, is the uh, data approach. Anyway, um, the Whoopsie, shoot, went all the way to the end. Ah, oh, how many, I can't read that. <laughs> Come on, it's gonna be fast. So we're almost there. So th this is just, uh, sorry, a few selected years from this, uh, this coal model. Uh, you've got a, a middle layer that, or sorry, the bottom trial layer, the acoustic layer, and then the combined uh, for selected years. And from those, you can actually go through and compute. Oh, jeez. I know. <laughs> I should have been drinking at lunchtime. Anyway, you get a picture of the availability to the acoustic in the bottom trial, and he's able to, to use that and come up with the availability through time. So relating this back to my assessment model and these swath of uh, key ages that have different vari variability, what I did was uh, profile across the rigidity of that changing availability. And so this is a way of testing input variances and the like, and I'll just highlight the standard deviation, of the normalized residuals showing that when you have a high CV, lots of flexibility to change. It doesn't overfit the, the bottom trial data according to that one criteria. So that's some support. I should put my glasses on. Maybe I can read the buttons. There we go. Um, and so it, it does have an effect on spawning biomass. If you assume a very rigid, non-varying uh, catchability coefficient. And most importantly, if you overlay uh, what Cole's independent estimate of availability is, over the period that it's available with, with uh, what we see, we don't get a perfect fit, but we do see that it's important and it's uh, the bar acknowledging the variability is important. And one of the things I hope we can do is for actual real uh, random effects models that we're able to inform some of the process error variances a bit realistically, because I worry, and this is the question I have for the group is, are we having too much impact by estimating variances and then forgetting about them. So a lot of these uh, SAM model and others, uh, you're estimating these uh, process error variances and basically assuming that, yeah, that's, that's okay. We'll throw away the information that might be available. So the other aspect, I'll, maybe I should skip this one, but I do think that in single species models, we underappreciate or 
underrate the importance of what Rick McGarvey was talking about is, is the weighted age or the actual population weighted age going forward. Yeah, you got one either. 20 minutes? Anyway, average weights are important. I do a, a random effects model outside the model, estimate the variances, bring them into the big model and use those variances as the fixed effects penalty weights, which I think is a, a, a really important and good way to do. Something that's not easy to do in a, in a standard package, very easy to do in, in your own, uh, own development thing. So that's just looking at some average weights uh, what, that's what I did. Moving on to the Seattle part. This is uh, a document that was just produced two days ago uh, dealing with the climate enhanced uh, multi-species model that we're using for a number of species in the Bering Sea. Um, they include Alaska Pollock, a uh, major predator both of itself, also Pacific Cod and Arrowtooth Flounder, uh, very voracious predators. But the process is the same as what we do for stock assessments. You bring in all the uh, survey data, fishery data, uh, estimate the parameters, and you're able to get output of the sort that affect uh, mortality. And here we see some, the, the ration is going up and we think that that is due to the, the warmer waters that we've been seeing in recent years. And that's something that can inform uh, what we might do for management down the road in a more strategic way. This is just showing some of the fits to, to the data that go in. These are the natural mortality rates that, that come out of those results. And uh, again, the predation index is shown here, but this is just the first step. So Andre talked about mice models. This is technically a, a pretty much of a mice model. It's not a huge one, but it's plugged into part of a, a much bigger project that um, is being funded I'm not sure where the money is, but it's a, it's a big project. Uh, we're doing all kinds of things, looking at uh, uh, recruitment models going forward, projections, and then also coming up with harvest guidance that's directly related to Alaska, and then looking at the, the climate, bringing in climate as part of this project. And that's a, another really big project, which you can gather from this excellent um, descriptive infographic. Yeah. No, my take home. We've seen that four times. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing, just enjoying all the talks this week and, and uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things about what I'm not hearing and what I think is, maybe it's lost, maybe it's, it's something that doesn't concern people anymore. But, um, you know, when we, I started this, my career, you know, robust, you know, fisheries data are not good. You know, we spend a lot of time data waiting, uh, worrying about things, wringing our hands, um, but nobody really talks about robustness much anymore. We had a, a nice talk yesterday from a Japanese colleague uh, on recruitment robustness, but that's not strictly data. That's, that's a, a little bit of a mix of data and, and um, you know, strong year class effects, I think is, is one way I would think about it, if I understand it correctly. Um, the other thing is, you know, we, we saw uh, some, uh, Matthew put up a, a, some code on selectivity, you know, it's like, well, nobody's really talking about problems. And I think if you put a computer programmer and a mathematician together, you're not going to necessarily know the best approach for parameterizing things. Uh, and the mathematician might be able to work it out, but I think he has to have the expertise or at least the knowledge that computers don't work like math always, right? There's still numerical issues. There's still, there, there's, there's precision problems. Um, I was gonna tell lots of different stories. Maybe I told too many, but um, it, it, it's, it's something that we need to be aware of, that you have to uh, bring in the kinds of people that have that experience and there's relatively few of them. Um, and the other thing I guess is pragmatism for management. I think these fantastic packages, uh, we should really be embracing um, the ecosystem and, and, and uh, biolo biologist in helping specify uh, operating models is plausibility. I mean, a lot of the IWC stuff, it was all just plausibility talking to biologists, you know, how, how much 
uh, should be inside an operating model for testing. And uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Jim. We have um, time for questions. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have a simple question. Uh, catchability Q values around the uh, one and even larger than one. So what is the dimension or unit? Because I do not see that it's a unit or dimension. So if I, if I understand the question is why, why catchability is different than one? My question is that unit of a Q, dimension of Q, because I don't see that. Dimension of Q. Isn't it, isn't it um, unitless? For Q? So to answer part of the question is that we don't specify a prior for catchability in the sense of it has to be area swept expanded equal to one. Or, or something that's estimated outside. So, um, are you saying uh, Q is a dimension list? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. So, Jim, um, since you didn't talk too much about the multi-species stuff. I could talk about it. <laughs> so do you, do you think we should have multi-species structure inside the next generation stock assessment model or should we be doing that as a separate project? So, uh, so it's a really good question. I, th I think Andre addressed a little bit um, of it in his talk. Uh, you know, the, the problem is that we don't really have our management system designed you know, around what are, what is, you know, what are you taking away from the ecosystem that might otherwise be functioning in a different way? And so, so that on the, that's on the one hand side. The other hand, the other popular thing that's done in Europe and we've done it here, uh, at least preliminarily, is take the natural mortality matrix outside of the multi-species model and put it in the single species model assessment. And I don't know if anybody's come up with a, the best practices of what to do then, like do you use the most recent estimate of M for scaling our traditional reference point calculations or, or the like. What is nice about this, it's you know, using the language of tactical versus strategic. Uh, we, for those that aren't familiar with that, it's basically tactical being what you do each year or each assessment for recommending or providing advice versus strategic where you might move the system towards something given the available information. And, and so we've always treated our multi-species models to date as a check, you know, are we really missing something by fishing as hard as we do right now? Uh, should, you know, so if, if I suspect that if our multi-species model indicated that we should be fishing far less, that it would have a different impact. So the fact that so far, touch wood, multi-species models generally say, yeah, you should catch more of these predators so you could have a release of some other things. And so, so in the future, do you see all our assessments being multi-species ecosystem assessments, or do you see them still being single assessments for the next, say, 10, 20 years? Well, the bottom little yellow thing there is kind of where I would want to go with with it you know so basically you know you can use the information you glean from a multi-species model as a way to partition out natural mortality and um, I think more importantly I think it would be useful to say what are robust management procedures against like what we've seen for a couple of stocks is spikes in natural mortality that are due to high temperatures Presently, there's a hypothesis that natural mortality of Pacific cod spiked in, in a very warm conditions that we've been seeing since 2016 in the Gulf of Alaska. Yeah, Andre? Just to follow that, follow that up, I mean, 
the one thing that multi-species models like this require, I mean, I like Seattle in the sense that it really is a generalization of the age structured models. It's not eco, whatever you want to put after eco, probably something impolite. Um, but it does require data. Um, and I think that's a really important part of, of whether these things go forward. So there's very few regions in the world that have enough diet data to estimate things like predator selectivity and diet rations and stuff. So I, I think if you go this road, just looking at how much data goes into models like Gadget and uh, MSVPA and Seattle, it's, 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 a big, it's a big ask. It's like going back to you know, the start of data collection for a single species assessment. So this is not a, if you go down these kinds of models, this is not a trivial exercise. Okay, Rick, yeah. But we also just saw from Nick the multi-fan where, you know, they're looking at multi-species models more from the perspective of the technical interaction. And, you know, there I see some potential benefits, you know, shared catchability deviations between species uh, and things like that could then be considered in a multi-species model. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim.